to uh, introduce Dr. Mike Crowley. Um, Mike began his, his research career doing his PhD in physical chemistry at uh, the University of Montana um, and went on to do a postdoc at Brandeis. And at this point, he was studying uh, nonlinear dynamics in uh, various chemical reactions and uh, chemical chaos. Um, he then became a member of the Senate State of Penn State, uh, continuing to study non equilibrium chemical reactions and also uh, semiconductor materials. Um, he then uh, started getting involved at, the, at the, with some of the different supercomputing centers, starting at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, and that's where he really started getting involved with uh, simulation of biomolecules, um, starting mainly to start my understanding with uh, more biomedical DNA and other related applications. Um, he worked on uh, the development of and, and improvement of the Amber and Charm packages uh, with uh, Charlie Brooks and Dave Case at the Scripps Institute. And uh, from there in 2007, he moved to NREL where he heads up a, a team of a uh, large number of uh, computational chemists and physicists um, as the uh, theoretical component of the uh, NREL uh, deconstruction team that encompasses a rather large group biochemists and microbiologists on top of the series. And so uh, we're very pleased to have him here today to talk to us about some of the modeling work they're doing at Enra. Okay, thank you, Seth. Thank you for having me. This is a real pleasure because I, I really didn't know much about EBI, so it's been a real nice day for me to find out. Actually, it's, it's a lot like NREL, only um, there's different, different things you're doing. Some of your equipment looks better than ours. Some, some, some equipment maybe we've got that you don't have. But um, it's, it's really very much the same types of, of efforts that we're, we're, we're putting out, I think, only um, different people doing different things. But I'm very, very happy to see the kinds of uh, uh, enthusiasm and, and the, the kind of work that you're doing. And I'm really looking forward to to keep in good contact with uh, people here. And it's been really nice for me to meet with students because since I've been at NREL, we really don't have many students around. So they, to get the enthusiasm of, and the, you know, the bright ideas and of, the, of, of students is really nice exposure for me today. So thank you very much. And I'll, I'll start telling you now about what I do here. Now this is kind of a, um, I'm not gonna get into much theory here, but I, I'll show you the kinds of things that we're trying to, the questions we're trying to answer that we think we can say something about um, using computation. And so what I, what I meant about the, the things that molecules that torture it is mainly deconstruction. You know, we're trying to take, take plant cell walls apart. And our, our interest right now with the, uh, with the computation is, is mainly to, to look at what is this substrate, uh, in particular cellulose. We're moving into lignin and, and hemicellulose more now, but, but those were too hard for us in the beginning. And at least cellulose was a bit more um, well-ordered um, polymer. So we, we, we're looking at then the questions we can answer. We think are, what is this substrate? What are the enzymes? How do they work? Why are they so slow? Is there something we can do about it by understanding how they work? And those are questions that we thought maybe we could say something about. And I'll show you some of the things that we think we've made some progress with. Um, and we work very closely with the, um, it doesn't want to move from this slide. It actually doesn't want to do anything. Oh, there we go. Let me try it again. There we go. All right, so this is, this is the first guy that I was exposed to when I was still at Scripps. And um, the, they were starting to work on, on trying to simulate this, this molecule and how it, how it deconstructed cellulose. So this is everybody knows this CBH1 enzyme. And some of the questions are, how, how does it... Um, how does, how does it bind to the surface with this binding domain? What's the purpose of this linker? How does the enzyme, how did a single strand, how does it find a strand? How does it get that strand up into the, into the tunnel? And then once a reaction occurs, how does it leave? How does it move on to the next, to the next uh, cello bios? And that's just this enzyme, never mind all the other enzymes that we'd want to say something about or get an idea of. The, but the one biggest question is, why is it so slow and how can we make it faster? And that's, that's, of course, one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is, well, maybe this is really, really fast considering what it has to work on. So these are the kinds of questions we wanted to, to look at, especially from the idea of, 
of uh, what are the barriers that has to go over because those are going to determine the rates of these things. So by, by doing some atomic analysis of these detailed analysis and doing it in such a way that we actually get statistical, statistically relevant results, not just sort of anecdotal one-off one um, results. So the, the general parts of this problem are, first of all, the cellulose, then the, um, the enzyme, and each part of the enzyme are things that we wanted to take a look at and answer questions about. These are the kinds of things that we look at then. Uh, I just mentioned about the biomass and the cellulose models. The force fields are something we really needed to, to take a close look at to make sure that we had that some confidence in the fact that what we were producing in virtual, in, on a computer, really did make contact with the true physics that were going on in these molecules. We also let them look at coarse grain models to try and extract out just the, the essential parts of the motions that are of interest to the question we're asking, and I'll show you one of those. Um, we've done some studies of cellulose then to get an idea of whether we can say anything about um, this, the structures that, that people are claiming are cellulose, and, and maybe we, we have something to say about what those look at like. Cellulose decrystallization, what is it that, that makes cellulose such a, a recalcitrant mo um, polymer? crystalline substance. Why is it so hard to pull it apart? Um, and then, of course, the cellulases. We look at cellulosomes, and we have a big uh, component of our effort is into making the codes do what we want to do to answer the questions we want to answer and make them perform as well as we can so we can answer those questions as quickly as possible. These are some of the methods that we use. Uh, we're very interested in thermodynamics, uh, so we, we want to do things that get the kinds of um, uh, statistics that we need to fill out whatever particular ensemble we're interested in and, and then extract from that either free energy or, or just uh, energy or entropic considerations. And so those, those are some of our methods. Uh, we also do some transition path sampling to get an idea of, of barrier behavior. And uh, then, of course, just straight old dynamics and kinetics. If I, uh, you'll see some pictures of that in a minute. Um, the, the structures themselves, we've done a lot of analysis of, of the structure of cellulose in particular. Uh, and we're moving into, we have, we've had the capability for a while to do the QMMM, but we've always, up to this point, thought that the reaction is the least important part of, of this problem. It's the fastest. Uh, it's just not the bottleneck, even though people keep saying, can you model the reaction? It's like, yeah, but we kind of know what that is, and we know it's fast, and it's not, it's not where the trouble is. So. Instead, we're, we're, we figured out almost right away that um, we've got to get the cellulose right if we're going to get this, if we're really going to say something important here. And what we found out very quickly was that uh, I needed to learn a lot about cellulose, but our postdoc, uh, James Matthews, came from Cornell where he'd been studying cellulose for a couple of years, and he's our cellulose expert. And so he taught us a lot about what's, what he know, knew about cellulose, and there are so many different forms of it. Um, and the, to the best of our ability, this is the way we understand their structures. You can get an idea that they're all sort of different. The difference between one alpha and one beta, you can't tell from this direction, but if you look down from the top, you can tell it's quite different. Um, it's, it, it, and, but it's only different in, in kind of a subtle way. The, the way that the crystallographers have been able to tell us is that mainly the top layer would be in, in one particular position, the next layer is, is shifted over. So for one beta, the third layer is directly under the first layer, which is why you can kind of see through it pretty nicely. But for one alpha, it shifts by a half a sugar and then another half a sugar and then another half a sugar and another half a sugar. So you get four, four levels down before you get to the fourth sugar and you get, you, you, you get uh, the repeat unit. So it's, from the top, it's quite different. But the first two layers, as you see, if you move by half a, half a sugar, it's identical in a one alpha and one beta. So some of it is exactly the same. Well, these are the kinds of details that we're wondering how these two can exist as different, you know, what is different about them. And maybe someday we'll get an idea about the energetics between them because we are very interested in how these transitions happen to get from one beta to one alpha and vice versa. For instance, you heat up one alpha, when you cool it down, it goes to one beta and you can't get it back the other way. Why is that? What's going on there? Um, one, in cellulose two and three, we're very interested in finding out what the thermodynamics of, of, de of decomposing these are, because these may be a lot easier to, to decompose than, than the one alpha, one beta. And if that's the case, then we need to rethink the problem. And in fact, we may need to change the enzymes because they may 
be able to be a whole lot faster on these as is or modified to work better on those. So these are the kinds of questions we're looking at. So James has done a lot of work looking at the different force fields. There are four different force fields out there for cellulose. Which one is right? Which one's the best one to use? Well, we've narrowed it down to two at this point. I'll show you some of that. But the devil is in the details with cellulose. You, you, we've tried coarse graining it, and you end up losing almost all the behavior that, that will give you the different allomorphs of one alpha, one beta, unless you actually model that in. You, you need all the little atomic details, and even so, we believe that we're, we do not have enough detail. We probably have to go to an electronic representation where we include, especially include um, the polarization, and that's going to that's going to be a whole new force field which doesn't exist yet. But judging by what we've got, I'll show you where where we're going with this. These are the three uh, conformations of the of the primary alcohol, and the two on the on the outside here have the OH pretty much in the same plane as the sugar. The third one, this GG, has it sticking down. And that one kind of disrupts the, um, it would disrupt a, a, a crystal pretty badly, because as you, as you force that guy down, something has to happen. Something has to give for that to, to work out. And I'll show you some of the results of that. But if you look at the crystal, the, look at sugars as they exist, in solution, uh, sugars and celadextrins, the ones that do dissolve, are almost all this GT. For, um, confirmation. The cellulose crystals are almost all GT and GG except for cellulose 1. So the one that we, we get out of the plants is, is almost all cellulose 1 and it's, um, or it is all cellulose 1 and they're all in, according to the crystallographers, in this TG formation. So the TG formation does not show up in dissolved sugars but it, it's the predominant form in what, we, what the crystallographers tell us is cellulose 1. So that's this is a couple of things that we can show you about it. In the TG form, these are the kinds of, of um, hydrogen bonding we see in the disaccharides. And they, clearly, they're quite different. And especially, you see why GG wouldn't show up in, in dissolved sugars, because it, it can have hydrogen bondings if it just uh, changes it around. But, but yet, having this guy point down into the, into the other layer or point up into the other layer is very, very dominant in cellulose 2, 3, and 4. Another aspect of, the, of this sugar that we had to be aware of is the, um, this phi psi angle here. The way, that, the way those two sugars um, rotate around the, the uh, glycosidic linkage there, turns out with high level quantum mechanics, you find out that the, that the lowest energy is not with the two sugars planar. It's with it slightly off so that you get a bit of a, a, a tilt to it. And what the consequence of that is, is that what you normally think of in a, in a in a cellulose, a crystal is just sort of these flat planes of sugars. It's not the way that, that the cell, a celadextrin chain wants to be. It'll make a very highly twisted uh, helical um, structure here. So this is the way it, it wants to be as a celadextrin in solution. It ends up doing this in solution and becoming a pretty stiff uh, chain. It, it's not very flexible and because of this, the way that it lays itself out like this. Now the, the upshot of that is that these guys, you know, going in and out of the, 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 the uh, screen here, they're all kind of wanting to twist. So if you put a whole bunch of them together and they're all wanting to twist, they, they can't twist inside there all the way because there's uh, steric hindrance between them. But the, the whole crystal can twist some. And depending on how thick you make that crystal, you'll get a different amount of twisting. Analyzing what the crystallographers tell us is the... Um, the uh, hydrogen bonding, we do see that this hydrogen bonding between the layer, between the chains, but they see almost no hydrogen bonding between the layers. Okay, there's hydrogen bonding across this way, but not between the layers. And that's one of the things which actually allows for the twist, because as you can imagine, as you start twisting something, um, what happens on the inside we can do a nice twist, but on the outside, if you start twisting something, those guys have to actually wind around. So they'll be longer than the ones on the inside. So something's got to give here. The outside ones have to stretch. The inside ones might have to compress. Eventually, you reach, you're going to reach an equilibrium of forces there where you'll reach how much twist you can get. So the thinner the fiber, you don't have to wrap around as much. You get a lot more twist than with the fatter fibers, the fatter you make it. So to, the crystal structures came from these hugely fat fibers that came out of algae and bacteria with, with almost no twist, because if it had the twist, there's no way they'd be able to get a structure because they don't have a, a nice repeating unit to get enough signal out of it. But, but for these guys, uh, 
So the, so the, 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 end, the, the point of making that, uh, telling you about that is that these crystals, the, the, what we're looking at, and we, we're considering this as a possible representative of the size of a microfibril that we see in most of the plants that we're interested in, these 36 chain, chain fibers. And there's a couple of different shapes you can choose for this, but this was just one we chose to, to have a, a, a systematic study of the, of the problem. Well, um, with, with this, we do, in fact, get a twist. And it, and it does happen when we've got no hydrogen bonding between the la layers to allow them to slip, to allow this compression or stretching to happen. It turns out that when you end up with, uh, this is, like, say, our, one of our first simulations with the amber force field for, for, um, uh, for cellulose, for, for carbohydrate here. And what we see is the, the yellow is the TG conformation. And in fact, glycam tends to like once you put it in the TG conformation, it likes to stay there, and that seemed to be a very nice simulation of, um, of what, what the crystallographers told us that cellulose um, one beta should look like. Here we see, from the interior, we see that it, we have a highly crystalline and well-defined um, TG structure on the inside, and on the outside, as you might expect, since it doesn't sit in a in, a, in, in the crystalline lattice there. A lot more can be going on. So it can be flipping between the other possibilities. In fact, some of them look a lot more like what it would be in solution where you get the GG and the GT. The other thing we look at here is you can, this is, this is a description of the hydrogen bonding going on. And the hydrogen bonding here, you'll notice, if, here's where a sugar chain would be, here's where a sugar chain would be. It's all between the, 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 um, the chains in a layer and there's very, very little hydrogen bonding between layers. All right, so this, this, is, this was our first experience with, um, uh, <clears throat> with, with looking at these force fields. Now, looking at the old charm carbohydrate force field, we had a completely different behavior from what, from what uh, the amber force field was showing us. So we had to make a choice here between these two. But it seemed pretty clear that this one wouldn't be it because there's no TG at all in this. It all went to this GG and, um, and GT. The other thing you'll notice is that uh, looking down the fiber, if it's got a twist to it, you sort of see this, this uh, fuzziness to it. That's because we're looking all the way down the fiber. In the other picture, we were only looking at a, a few, few rings thick. So that, that's an indication that we've got a twisted fiber. You see that it, the hydrogen bonding is all within the layer like in the last one. But here, we see there's a lot of hydrogen bonding between layers. And you also notice that because of that, it takes the twist right out of the, out of the fiber. So, I'm not saying whether or not we know for sure that fibers are twisted or not, but if they are twisted, then this is not our force field. If there is TG, according to, you know, if, if these small fibers do in fact follow what, um, what the crystallographers say, then this guy is right out. As it turns out, with other evidence, this guy we did throw out, especially because charm has a new force field. We're calling that C35. So here's the old charm force field, and here's the new one. And you see the new one retains the twist, it does end up with, with plenty of TG in there, and it ends up also um, with something new, which is this alternating layers of um, TG and GT, and so, uh, or GG rather. And here, the Gromos force field, even though it looks very much the same as this one, it doesn't have the twist. It does get the alternating layers, and this is something we've, we've seen now in, in multiple simulations, which in, I'll, I'll show you, even including glycam that this is something that we think is, is very important and probably does exist in cellulose. And we need, we need more and better data from the experimentalists to find out whether or not this is, in fact, true of these smaller fibers. One of the things then that's wrong with this one, which is to throw this one out, is you'll notice this guy here looks like a diamond that's kind of tilted over that way. Well, this guy, the unit cell, is flipped over to the other side. So it's got that all wrong. And so we, we chuck this guy out. Glycam has another problem in that the unit cell has uh, too long in and, out of the, in and out of the plane here. It's got the, the glycosidic angle is a little bit off, so it, it extends it by about 10%, makes it, the fiber 10% longer than it ought to be. So we're a little, a little nervous about the glycam one. This one makes us a little nervous because we've got this alternating layer that we'd really like to have some confirmation of. But you can, I'm trying to give you the idea that doing the glucose just, just deciding that, oh, I'll use the amber force field or I'll use the whatever force field, it really matters with, with, um, 
with, with uh, carbohydrates. When, when you go to do proteins, use amber force field, use charm force field, you're good. You know, you're, there's just little tiny things which probably don't affect the questions you're answering, asking. These, these could really affect the questions we're asking. So this is something we're continuing to study here. And this just gives you an idea that we do. We can, in fact, um, reproduce the idea that the size of the fiber changes the amount of twist. When you've got, uh, they look at these two 40 mers, one with 36 chains and one with 16 chains, you get twice as much twist out of the one that, that's smaller. All right, so moving on here, this was a, a, quick, um, a quick and dirty simulation where uh, we were interested in running a long fiber and see what happens with the twist. I'm going to try to run it again here for a minute. But what you'll notice is that it, it develops a twist. It must have gone backwards. Okay, so here it's starting over again. And you see the twist developing up here and moving down the chain before it starts making these, these bulges, which we, we need to figure those out. Um, one of the things that we did notice about them is that they, they always form in, in the same you know, they, they bend in the way the plane is. They don't, they don't bend this way, okay? And so that was one thing we found out. We're not sure whether this simulation, the bends came from the fact that we started with a slightly compressed uh, uh, fiber, and, and it was the, the, the compression of the fiber that produced it. Uh, that's still something to be studied. But what we were interested in, though, is notice also, even though it does start a twist, the twist goes away again after it, after it forms. And I'm going to show you... a one more um, uh, demonstration of that. Now, continuing with the cellulose here, we went to high temperature um, because we wanted to see how these force fields would behave at a high temperature. And what we found pretty quickly is that they all pretty much gave almost the same behavior. Uh, the, uh, the CSFF, we can ignore this one because it really never goes back to having any TG. But we noticed that, that glycam and the new charm force field went to pretty much the same high temperature behavior. So we're getting a feeling that this is probably a, a behavior that is characteristic of cellulose uh, because it's one that seems ubiquitous among the, the force fields. So this one sort of went, went bad on us. So we're going to really throw this one out because uh, it, it does not seem to, to behave the way experimentally cellulose behaves. It does tend to stay as fibers at the temperature we went to. Um, but one of the things we also noticed about um, about the glycam force field was back at room temperature, I showed you how it stays nice and crystalline with the yellow in the middle like that. It only stays that way if you start it in that configuration. If you start it even with a few of them in a different configuration, it snaps right into this alternating layer configuration. The other thing to notice about this is at high temperature, there's no twist left in there. So I'm just going to show you then what happens over time. If we run out to 100 nanoseconds here, which is a fairly long time for a, for a simulation, um, we find that there's a, a very quick change that happens you know, at, at a certain point where the twist goes from being what we have as 40 degrees there, basically to untwisted. And at the same time, we see the, the change in the, in the hydrogen bonds that are between the layers all of a sudden show up. So the showing, the, the, when, these, when these hydrogen bonds show up, between the layers, it tends to pull the layers back in line, the ones that it's stretched or the ones that are compressed so that they, they, cannot, they can no longer have that twist. So this, this was an important observation for us. And along with that, we could see that those hydrogen bonds come from the um, disappearance of the TG here. All right? It was all, pretty much all TG, and it, it disappears, and the appearance of these GT and GG. We, and there's a few other things that we can see with that. This was the other, the other force field, which took much longer for that, for that conversion to happen. Um, so it also shows us that people who are running a couple of nanoseconds may really be missing the, the, the behavior, the, the real equilibrium behavior of their, of their cellulose. Depends on what question you're asking, of course. But if you're, if you're wanting to know whether your, you know, if your force field is showing you the behavior, you may have to run for a long time. And this was at 500 degrees where things happen a lot faster than they do at room temperature. So when we run at te room temperature, we found that we're having to go out to a microsecond of simulation on these to get what we think is getting close to an equilibrium behavior. So for one of these, for one of these fibers to run out to, to a microsecond, it would probably take about a half a million hours 
Yeah, so we had a lot of computer time available to us. It was, uh, the TerraGrid was starting to like us, and, and, and they, this, this computer they had in, in, ten, in, in Tennessee, um, they, they went from, you know, the DOE's got this big Jaguar machine, and so uh, TerraGrid built an, a copy of that that was smaller, but, but still a fairly large machine, and they called that Kraken. And then when they went from a Cray, Cray 4 to Cray 5, uh, whatever that was, the XT4 to XT5, they built a whole new machine, and then they had this old one, this XT4, which actually ran MD better than the new one did. And they was just sitting there, and they said, you guys have at it. So we just had at this machine, and we, we could crank and crank and crank on it. So we thought, we'll let them run. And, and we found out all sorts of things that we, we didn't, Actually, we, didn't, we really didn't want to know that, that we'd have to run a microsecond to find out how this thing behaved. But, but it turned out to be fairly important. And, and analyzing it carefully, we see that you know, before the transition occurs at 20 nanoseconds, this is on that 100 nanosecond, 500 degree run, we see the twist in the fiber. And we see that between the, the red is the hydrogen bonds. You don't see so many hydrogen bonds between layers as you do once it untwists and, and after the transition occurs. Another thing that we, you'll notice is that in the, in the low temperature behavior, most of these chains are, are flat with the, you know, this hydrogen bonding between them, and they're nice and flat. When the change occurs where we get this, this GG and GT uh, replacing the TG, all of these tend to tilt one way, and these tend to tilt the other way. And it's that tilting and the rearranging of, the, of, the, um, of, the, of the, that sugar that allows these hydrogen bonds to happen between the layers. Yeah. Uh, each, yes, we run, we'll run these on up to, say, 500 cores. Um, and and when, when those run, each one is doing a different, usually a different set of atoms, but, he, but, they're, but they're communicating with all the others at every time step. All the forces, all the, all the contributions are collected in, in, a, in an intelligent way, uh, as, as intelligent as where we are right now. We have better ways of doing that. We're still coding in. But, but yes, at every single time step, all the information is, is, is synced up so that all the atoms have all the contributions they need to, to make the co correct next step. Uh, does that answer your question? OK. All right, so this is just a quick movie of, of watching that transition occur. And you see it straighten out, and then I'll run the movie backwards, and you'll see it untwist again, just to give you an idea of the, the magnitude of this. It's a significant amount of twisting and untwisting. And that, we believe, has, has a, a significant if it's true, ha has a significant effect on how high temperature um, cellulose would behave as opposed to low temperature cellulose. So the idea that, for instance, if you have a twisted, a twisted fiber and you bring another twisted fiber next to it, they're not really going to mate up because they're, they're kind of twisted in the, 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 the sides that are matching up are, are opposite sort of um, angles to each other. But once it untwists, they, there's a much lo larger chance of it coming together and actually binding together because all the sugars will be lined up in a nice way. So that, that has, a, has, a, has a significant effect on, on what, the, say, a pretreatment would do, whether you use heat or not, what happens to those fibers. And the, the second thing is, if these things are untwisting and they're very, very long, which we know that these fibers are very long, you can start untwisting this thing, but you're not going to untwist the whole fiber. There's no way that's going to happen, partly because of the way it's, it's bonded to everything else in the system. But s sections of it can untwist. Now, as those start untwisting, what happens to the twist? It's going to all get compressed in certain areas. And that's the next thing we're going to be looking at, is what happens if you compress twist into a certain area? Now, do you all of a sudden get something that we might call amorphous? You know, is, is this something that that is now a part of the, the cellulose that we need to look at and see if this isn't what, what creates a, a region that, that enzymes can attack better than they can on, on this crystalline cellulose part of it. But anyway, that's just another aspect that we're going to be looking at uh, based on this idea of twisting. And this is just another movie to, to let you see the development. And somewhere in the middle of this movie, you'll see lots of hydrogen bonding between them. And we, we act, there is an actually an experimental um, uh, 
This is a little bit of a close-up of that. Um, experimental evidence that as you increase the temperature, the deuterium exchange into the center of these fibers goes up. And we believe that that uh, has a large part to do with now, if you don't have hydrogen bonds between the layers, all you have them is, is within a layer and, and coming down the chain this way. The only way the, the deuterium can make its way in is coming in from the ends, and that could take a very long time. If you have the hydrogen bonds between the layers, there's a way in from the edge to make its way by, by exchanging all the way through into the side. And the other thing we notice is that the path that we can find was only through one of the faces, not through the other face. And there, and there also, there seem to be, we can't tell exactly from the paper, so we're going to run the experiments ourselves. There, there are ways to get uh, cellulose one where one of the phases is dominant or the other phase is dominant. So it'll be stretched out one way or stretched out the other way. And one of those, of course, then will show good deuterium exchange or very quick, and the other one will show very slow because it has to come in a long way versus a short way. So we're going to run those experiments to see whether, in fact, that does coincide with the, um, what we're trying to do here. Let's ignore this because we want to get past cellulose. Uh, we're not going to get... Uh, all of these are run with water. We're just not showing the water. No, no, they're explicit water, yeah. So I don't understand the question, and I just wanted to let you know that we, they were run with explicit. No, no, we, it, we in fact, we've tried it with implicit water because, of course, we could get a lot more simulation in there, but the, but the cellulose blows apart. So we think that there's something wrong with the, the way we've, we, we didn't do any uh, reparameterization of the, um, of the implicit solvent parameters, the, the GB radii for, for these particular molecules. So we have to, we have to go back and reparameterize before we can use per implicit solvent. So we're just staying away from that for now. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this, this is, I don't know why that, that, this is a possible another 36 crystal. And what we'll notice here is that we do know that um, at least binding domains tend to bind to the surface, to the hydrophobic surface on the top there. But where do the enzymes work? And, and is there a reason thermodynamically why they may choose a, one face over another or one chain over another? For instance, on the top there, you'll notice there's a middle chain and then there's two edge chains. Which one is the easier one to, to, um, for the enzyme to get at? Well, we just looked at that as a piece of the puzzle. Uh, and choosing one of the chains here we ran some, uh, these simulations on, on a corner, an edge, a middle, and another edge. So we did all of these by what we called uh, using a, a reaction coordinate of what we call native contacts. So we, we add up all the possible so-called native contacts. Basically, everything that's within a 12 angstrom radius of this is called a native contact. So we end up with hundreds of native contacts for this yellow part of this chain. And then we, we run a bunch of simulations where we slowly reduce the number of allowed native contacts. And that'll sort of force that out of, um, out of, out of the crystal. And we can, we can gain, gain back all the, um, the thermodynamic information about all the places it can visit. Um, and, and then we can, we can back out that bias we put on it to get back the true, the true um, probabilities in the, in the, um, in the ensemble of, of states as it goes from crystallized to uncrystallized. I'll show you that in a minute. But the main thing is that by, by using this native contact thing, instead of just sort of pulling on this end of it, it allows it to, to visit wherever it wants to, as long as it stays within how many native contacts. So we may start with 800 native contacts, and we go down to zero. So it's a very continuous sort of thing, even though there's you know, the discrete contacts. But, they, but it, it ends up being a very continuous graph, as you'll see here. Uh, this is just an idea of what it looks like with um, all the native contacts, half of them, and then uh, none of them. Actually, what we did was we only chose the first eight as being the ones that we, we used for uh, calculating the native contacts. And this is just sort of a movie of, of what it looks like. So you get an idea that we were able to get sort of the configurational uh, entropy part of this, not just the, the, the energetic part of, of moving it out of the crystal. And it really made a difference because we did it the other way first. 
where we just, we just took the distance between this first sugar and someplace in the crystal here and just kept increasing that. What it tended to do was, since this guy wants so much to be inside the crystal here, it would pull it as a straight line down here. And as we went across the top of the crystal, we got the same free energy for all three. And we're thinking, that can't be right. There's something wrong here. When we went with the native contacts, we got, back, we got the entropic part back, which turned out to be very important for the middle one. And we got, we got three different curves. This is for the one at the top of the crystal where there's, there's no neighbors to it. So you'd expect that one to be the easiest to get out. So the price to pay for getting this one out is much lower than for the others. But we found out that the edge chain is, is significantly lower than the one in the middle, which you would have expected because the one in the middle has got hydrogen bonds to the side. But we not only have confirmation of our intuition, but we also have a, a number, and this is a number that we can't get from experiment yet. So we got a number that now we can put into our formula as we look at all the different things that that enzyme has to do to, to, to degrade cellulose. One of them is get the chain out of the surface. Uh, and these, these are the answers we got there. The differences are, are significant when it comes to, to um, pulling it out. Now this is 35 k calories, or the 27 is the one we're more interested in. Um, because, see, once, the, once the, this edge is gone, what you're left with is two edges here. Uh, and so we're, we're guessing that edges are the things that, th that these um, enzymes work on. And what we've seen in all the simulations up till now is you'll smack an enzyme down on the top of a big slab of cellulose, and it's pulling something out from the middle. And so what we found out here is that's probably not the way it works. It's much more likely it's going to go for the easy one. And then just by taking that one out, you're left with two other easy ones. And of course, in the very beginning, the easiest one is the one on the top, if that, in fact, is the shape of a microfibril. Um, but anyway, no matter what the shape of the microfibril is, we have an idea that the edge ones are the ones that are, that are easier to get out. But the two edges that remain after the first edge is removed equivalent energetically to the two edges that are, remain after the quarter is removed? Uh, we, we didn't actually test that, but our guess is that that's, that's probably true. And, and one thing we did do, though, was we took, what we did was assume that this is an edge, and if you remove that, that would be an edge, and this, you would be left with a corner. So um, if, you, if you remove, the, uh, or if you remove the middle one, what you'd be left with is two corner ones. And what we found out is that, what we did was we added up the numbers and found out that if you took the free energy of removing this one, and then that one, it's the same as removing a middle and then a corner. So we think our thermodynamics at least is consistent within what we did. Because um, you end up, to get from the initial state to the final state, what's it? What is a mole? Oh, a good question. This is per mole of the, of the entire, of the five, uh, five nanometer, five nanometer, that that we of uh, so it's 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 five cello, fel, cello bios, okay, it's per per five from per moles is five cello bios. So divide that by five to get per per cello bios. It's around five kcal per cello bios. All right. So now we're going to go on to the uh, take a look at what's my time here. I have, I have 15 minutes? OK. Um, let me just move quickly past this. The idea here is that we're, we're interested in uncovering each piece of the problem rather than trying to treat the whole problem as one. And we have an idea maybe at first of, of how much it takes to pull this out of the surface. Or as it moves along, each time it, it rejects a, uh, ejects a cello bios unit, it's got a peel out another cello bios. So we're, we're, we're estimating that we've got a 5k cal per mole cello bios price that has to pay just to get this out of the surface when it does the other. Now there's all the other pieces of the problem, such as the hydrolysis part, which we have a pretty good idea of what that is, and it is about 5k cal per mole. So that comes out about a wash. What we don't know now is about the threading. Once it, once it expels the product, the, um, it's got to move it into the, um, into the next spot for, for uh, Reaction. We also don't know about the expulsion. So how much how much energy does it take, or what what is the, you know, what do you get back from when the, when the product leaves? Now we think that's probably an endothermic process because it it does in fact have uh, product inhibition. 
So we're expecting that to find that this thing likes to stay bound with the enzyme. Um, that's boring. Let me move on here. The idea then is if we understand how each, if we take a look, get an idea of what those barrier heights are, and we understand what the details of those processes are, we can maybe start saying, change, making suggestions about what could be changed to lower those barrier heights and get this, this thing running a bit faster. So for threading and for expulsion, these two are the ones that we're going to take a look at and assume that the hydrolysis is really working pretty well, which we do know from experiment when this thing runs on soluble substrates, it screams. So we really probably don't have to deal with that. First thing, thing we did was then to pull it, out of the, pull it out of the tunnel and see what sort of energetics we see. What's it being bound to? What's holding it up? Uh, what does it look like? And it does seem to be that, that as, as the experimental suggests, there are, in fact, binding sites where it gets stuck in certain spots and then, and then can move along. So if we analyze that a little bit, um, we find out that as it comes out, there are, there are places where I see that the interaction energy between this, a particular syllabios along that chain, in particular the one that's all the way inside, has to go over a barrier, then it gets stuck again, and it goes over another barrier and gets stuck again before it finally leaves. And I notice that the second cellobios has the same barrier. So there's a, there's a certain spot there I can take a look at and see where they're, what they're binding to there. And in order to get a better idea here, we're only really interested in not so much the initialization of it. We'll look at that later. But for now, the, the process, processive part of it, this thing has to move through from just after reaction to where it's ready for reaction again. And to get this is really, really difficult. And this is just a, for our first estimate using something called nudged elastic band, where we take 10 copies in, at one end and 10 copies at the other end and put springs between them so that they, they sort of pull themselves together and we get, we get copies of the system at all the different stages along the way. And um, what we found out, this is, this is typical of this, um, well, yeah, typical of this is we get some, some huge barrier that's way out of control. But it does give us an initial estimate of, of what the process has to be. Now, we're going to refine this to, get, to find out where this, this goes down. But um, this was put on hold because we, 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 got, we hit this huge uncertainty about which force field we should be using. And one of the things that has to happen, and that's where this big barrier is, is the ring has got a, got a pucker in a really odd way. So we're working on that now that we've got what we think is a good force field. But one of the things we did in that analyzing this process of going from before we, uh, right after reaction to being ready for the next reaction is that if we look at this total energy um, of the system and then break it down into the interaction of the protein with itself, the interaction of the cell, celodextrin with itself, and the interaction of the protein with the celodextrin, that should, that should add up to the total. And if we look at each piece of it, we notice that the celodextrin with itself is just sort of Boring. Nothing's happening there. This peak is made up all of the interaction of the celodextrin with the protein, and there's a big change in the protein that leaves us in the purple here. The protein must be going, undergoing some pretty serious changes that are energetically unfavorable for this process to happen. So we're going to be looking pretty closely at that. If we examine this blue line here, which is the interaction of the celodextrin with the protein, uh, the dogma has always been that there's these uh, tryptophanes in, in, in the tunnel. And it's always sort of bothered me because I, I did not see where a large energetic interaction was going to be with the sugars with these tryptophanes. And as we find out, the Van der Waals interaction is just flat. There's just no, no barrier to movement. It's all in the electrostatics. It's all in hydrogen bonding. So this, this is where we're now uh, taking a look at which all of the, these different um, hydrogen bonding pairs along this path. And what we see right here is, in, in particular, what's happening is um, there, there's a, a hydrogen bonding pair that gets pulled along, and it gets to its, its, re, its uh, stretched out point and snaps over back to the, to the next uh, sugar, or in the next uh, cellobios. So that's what's going on in, in these regions where you, where you see these barriers. But clearly, those, um, those tryptophans, though they're necessary, are not energetically changing. They're, they're, to me, it's clear that they're in there for, for twisting this thing into position, but it, it slides right past it like it's soap. 
All right, I'm going to go past this. This is just to show you that when we when you analyze the interactions carefully, the blue ones are the ones that are are very uh, strongly uh, interacting with the with the celadextrin, and the white ones are the ones that are very weakly interacting, and the red ones are ones that actually end up with a with a positive energy, and that's because of the way this one is pulling in. It's changing the protein in such a way that it puts this one in an unfavorable. But the magnitude of this one's attraction is way bigger than the. Then, then this one is being repelled. Just to give you an idea that we can analyze these sorts of interactions. Um, this was then we wanted to take a look a little bit about what's going on with the water. These were the crystal waters as, as came out of the crystal structure of this, pro, of this enzyme with the, um, the substrate in place. <clears throat> and our, our next question, of course, is probably there's more water there than, than what the, the, um, the crystal structure is going to show us first. Second. Which ones of these are, are going to stay there are they for a while? So we, we took a look at what was in the vicinity of the celadextrin. And the red ones I colored because they, they just stayed there throughout the whole simulation of, a, of several nanoseconds here. These other colored ones here, the ones that are sort of fatter, are ones that I, I picked out that because they're in the vicinity of the celadextrin, but they come and go. And one of the things that if you notice this one right here, it just tends to be there. There tends to almost always be a, a water in this position, though not always the same one. Um, the experimentalists had been indoctrinating us to say, well, the, the, um, the, uh, the, the water that's going to do the hydrolysis is coming in through some little tunnel through the protein up here. They had this, they had this model that they, they had somebody make, and they looked and said, oh, look at this little tunnel here. That must be how the water gets in there. And, and, and what, what I see is that it's much more likely that here's the bond that's going to break. It's much more likely that this water here is going to be the one first. And second, it's really good that they can come and go. Because then, then when that one goes, it, there's a way for it to get in. So we took a look at this same simulation and look at over time, if we look at the water in the vicinity of, of the reaction site, these waters would be here, these white ones. And then after a while, I look at which ones are in there. And then these red ones are in here. And so where were the red ones when the white ones were in there? They're kind of all over the place. So this is a very labile um, site. But as you could see from that movie, there's one spot there that always has a water just sitting right in there, even though they come and go. There's always something in there. So we're going to be, that's what we're going to feed into a QMMM simulation to get an idea of how this reaction occurs. And that was just to show you uh, how the white ones leave and the red ones come in. Um, all right, so Lin Tao now did a, did a simulation to get an idea of that expulsion part. Let's get an idea of what the energetics are for the product to leave. So this is the product right here. And we apply a force to it to pull it out. And we do it multiple, multiple times. And this is called the Jarzinski um, uh, method, where you can get the, what's called the, you know, the, re the reversible work. If you do the irreversible work enough times, you can get the right average. And you, can, and you can get the true PMF, the, the, the free energy of this thing leaving. Um, our, our first uh, intuition was, well, how do you know when you've done it enough times? And um, what, what has been shown very often is that even when you, when you it, was, it was believed that this was the greatest thing since sliced bread because it's so easy to do this. You know, you don't have to generate what, what I'll show you in a second here. You don't have to do this, where we have to do all of these simulations to get from the protein plus ligand to the protein bound with the ligand. In fact, we're interested in the other way, but it's the, it's the same thing. Um, we have to go through all of these steps of, of um, conf, uh, confine the ligands configurationally, and then remove the water from the ligand, and then put the ligand into the binding site, uh, turn, um, turn off the, the, the rotational um, ability of the ligand, and, uh, and then, I don't remember what this one is, but then the next step then is to turn back on the, con the rotational part. And then, uh, oh, okay, so this is just sort of bound in there, but then we turn on the interaction with the protein. Um, yeah, so this is where it's all bound, but, but there's no, the protein doesn't know the ligand there, and the ligand doesn't know the protein's there. They're just sort of held in there by, by restraints. And then as we turn things back on, we eventually let the water back in, uh, and let, let the whole thing go back to where it was. This is a huge process, and it's really difficult. But it gives us what we consider a, a good answer. Well, when we, when we ran it with the Jarzinski, where you just pull, 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 and you just run all these simulations, it turned out we had to do as much or more in terms of computation 
to get the Jarzinski to converge to the other, to the other uh, answer. But this is so much easier that we, we're pretty much using this now um, because we figure we've confirmed it with the other and we know about how much it takes for these kinds of simulations. So we can do this with other proteins now. The, the upshot of this is that, um, let's just give you an idea of one of, the, one of the simulations where you get an idea that we, we, we are picking up uh, pretty much what all the configurational space that needs to be visited is here. And by the time it gets out here, it, there's no more interaction with the uh, protein. And these are, the, these are all the different pulling exercises where we get the, the irreversible work coming out of a, by applying the force. And then by applying uh, Jarzinski's relation here, we can get what the, what the true free energy should look like. And depending on which method you use, you do get some funniness in the middle here, but they all converge to the same answer. So we're happy with what we see out here. A couple of these are ones where we have simply removed um, one or two of the trajectories, and you can see they're marked out in red. Um, so the, there are a few trajectories that really can bias this, but they, even so, they give us the same, the same answer at the end. Uh, and the answer we got was that it takes about 14 kcals. Now, we think that's a pretty big number for, uh, for removing a, a product, but it does give us the, the general idea. Now, from here, we went and looked in detail about what's happening as it comes out on all those trajectories and got some t statistics about which which amino acids were interacting with it as it came out. And using those, uh, uh, Lin Tao mutated those to say alanine and, and redid the whole experiment and found that instead of 14, he could bring it down to 10 and down to five by mutating those, those residues. And those are in the, in the pipeline now of the microbiologists to make those and, and test them out. And uh, we're, we've, I feel pretty certain we are gonna see that, that the um, that the binding of the, of the cell bias is gonna go down, but whether we've ruined the catalytic activity, we don't know yet. So that's, that's, that'll be the proof of the, whether or not this was worth doing. Um, all right, I'm gonna skip over this, because I want to show you the cellulosome. Uh, Lin Tao also then did generate a, a, a uh, coarse grain model for cellulose, and we threw a, uh, he, he just on a whim, put an all-atom model of a binding domain on there, and to his surprise, the, the, it just started moving down the, down the chain all by itself. And this, of course, sent the microbiologists, just, they, were, they were so happy to see that this actually, what they thought would happen is true. It turns out that it, it, was, it was kind of luck that it went in the, in the right direction. Uh, there's no reason why it should go in that direction. I, we don't really know why, but if you run it lots and lots of times, it goes in both directions. All right, so you get, you get pretty much a distribution of, of, of movement across the surface, which looks a lot like just a one-dimensional diffusion here. And, but what we went, one of the things we went on to do then was to, um, was to get a, a free energy diagram of, of this on the surface. And we went to an all, back to the all-atom model to get an idea of why that would be. And we did, in fact, see that there were low-energy regions that it could hop between and get an idea of what the barrier was between them. We also ran it where we took, we took one of this, what this is here, this whole grid was of these four corners of it in this position and then 120 positions this way and 40 positions that way all the way across to get an idea of where, where this thing likes to be. We also took it and put it in one of these wells and flipped it, rotated it around and found out that it, it's, it's like, it's, where it likes to be best is facing in the direction that the uh, CBH1 does like to go. Um, and the other thing we found out here was uh, after running for a long time um, that it, it does, in fact, uh, migrate in both directions. What we also found out, which was uh, back to his simulation here, was you can't really pick it out here, or at least I can't see it right, right here, right here. He has a break in the strand. So he had also made a break in the strand that we didn't know about, and by putting that break in the strand, and you'll notice that, that even though because this is a coarse grain model, he didn't, there's no extra atoms in there that would kind of push it out of the surface the way you would see it if you actually did have a hydrolysis event in the middle. But when he, when, we put it, when he put it on there, even just having that break there, it turns out that the free energy profile, even though it goes up and down through those wells, when there's a break, the free energy profile of this thing on the surface kind of goes downhill for two spots before it levels off again and then it would have free diffusion in both directions. It does, in fact, move away from a break in our, in our simulations. Whether that's true in nature or not, that, that, that may, remains to be seen. If you put it behind the break, 
it can migrate up to it, up to it but, but not past it. And it, it, you know, it kind of doesn't make sense looking at it here because how does it know there's a break in there? Uh, we don't have an answer to that, but just phenomenologically, we, that's what we see at this point. So it's an interesting result of, of the CBM. Now, we took the next step, and that was some studies of the CBM to take a look at the linker. And the, the dogma from the linker was that there was sort of this inchworm mechanism that the, the linker played an important role in, where the, it could act as a spring, where, where this guy may, may sort of chew up a piece, and then it sort of pushes him forward because this guy acts like a spring. Or, or that this guy goes forward and tends to pull this guy forward. Uh, there was some thinking going on that di didn't make sense to me because I'm not used to seeing a single strand of protein acting like a spring. It seems like it ought to be more like a wet noodle. So Greg took, on, took this project on and ran uh, what we call replica exchange on this, where you just run this at multiple temperatures um, and allow, allow the higher temperature systems to traverse around your energy. You don't get stuck in a minimum, but it feeds sort of seed, seed molecules back down to the, to the lower temperatures so that you get, and you can, you can get out of that the entire statistics of how this thing would behave if you ran it for a very, very, very long time at room temperature. And what he found out right away was it, with glycosylation or without glycosylation, there was no springiness to this. Uh, it pretty much, until it was all the way stretched out, you didn't see any, any, any significant um, springiness to it. So the only difference that the glycosylation went, made was it tended to move the, the, um, the minimum out a little bit. But mostly this acts just like you would expect a wet noodle to act. And so this, this got back to the, uh, went, went back into our model and sort of helped the biologists understand that you need to throw that, um, that, that idea out and, and really understand that what this guy does is he just binds to the surface, and, and then the tether keeps this guy near the surface. But he really does not pull or push or do anything like that. He probably runs around like a dog on a leash and just kind of you know, gets caught by the neck when he goes too far. And when he gets near a break, maybe, maybe he moves a little bit away from it. But that's about all. That was our, our um, new insights into this. So the next thing I'll show you is just a quick uh, idea of what these cellulosomes do. We've got the bacteria that make cellulosomes. I think you're probably all familiar with these. So I'll just go, go on ahead here to show you um, what, what the way we're looking at this and what we want to model. And we see that there's kind of three levels of cellulosome modeling and, and uh, questions that we could answer. We can answer about different domains and different proteins like the cohesin dockerin do, um, domain. We've got ideas. Uh, we have some simulations of how, how this interaction happens and what we can do to, to uh, manipulate it. Um, we're taking a look at this, uh, the cell nine with the, um, uh, I can't remember what that thing is, the immunoglobulin domain on there, figuring out what on earth that thing does, uh, because it's a, it's a mystery how that thing works. This X domain, also called fibronectin-like domain, what is that doing? Um, how do the CBMs work, and why are there different CBMs along this thing uh, and on the different enzymes? So that's at one level. We get a little bit farther in, we can look at you know, whole, whole large systems, but not the whole thing. When we get to the whole thing, we, we have to go to this um, coarse grain model. And there's a few questions that we've, this is the first place we've looked. We've done a lot of work down here too. Um, not much work here, but, but we've got some work up here where we're interested in how does this thing populate? And the way we did that then was to take a look at, um, take a look at this, this uh, this uh, CIP-A scaffold in here. And notice that we've got all these linkers between it, which are, now we're, we're going to model these as wet noodles. And it, in fact, matches if we throw those sequences into this ponder uh, program, which takes a look at sequence and then suggests where's uh, disordered protein and where's, where's ordered protein. And all the linker regions went to the di disordered region. So they are, in fact, most likely um, disordered. And all of our simulations show them as disordered as well. And this is basically just another, another measure of the same thing. But what we took then, these, we, we took a look at all the, the enzymes that we knew go onto these cellulosomes and, and classed them into sort of three, three general uh, classes, small, medium, and large. And this large one is just made up of a whole bunch of domains, a very complex enzyme. 
from there we said, okay, let's make, let's make, instead of working on all atom bases, we're not interested in, in all the little atomic interactions. We're more interested in how this thing comes together. So we model this, um, this thing as, as, as just a bunch of smaller uh, beads, or rather sort of large beads made up of a bunch of atoms. And a cohesin dockerin was, was uh, modeled so that a cohesin and dockerin kind of looked like this. They both look like this. And the three red balls here are ones that can attract the other guy. All right, so otherwise there's no interactions between particles here except repulsive ones. Enzymes were modeled so that they had about the right shape and volume and mass, but they had, uh, and they had, and they had flexible linkers wherever they had them. And so here's, here's the doctrine that's got a link to that cohesin, and inside there's those three red balls that will, will link up to a cohesin. And again, all they can do is repel other things. The only attraction is between the cohesin and doctrine. And the big guy, is made up of all these different domains with linkers in between them. So the upshot was we were interested in if we throw all of this into a box uh, where, where these things are just sort of hard, hard spheres that bang into each other except for those attractions, um, how will this thing populate? Uh, and, and our guess was that these little guys that can run around the box very quickly are going to populate this thing quickly and not let these slow guys who never or very rarely get over near the, um, uh, the, this SIP A. Will, will populate it the least. And we saw exactly the opposite. And so this is just a simulation to give you an idea of, what's go, of, of what it would look like. And one thing to notice, uh, the solid sort of ones are the ones that will bind, just to lead your eye to that. And you'll see this guy, he's, he's, he's going to come close here and, and immediately he grabs on. But a lot of these ones, like say these shaded ones, you'll notice them as they get near the, this, um, this scaffold in here, they just sort of go right past it. And it turns out that these guys bind like five times more than the, than the little guys, even though the little guys are visiting it much more often. They just have to, they have to be in the right orientation to hit. Otherwise, they just kind of go flying past because their, their doctrine is facing the wrong way. When one of these big guys gets nearby here, he has a, he's kind of moving so slowly that that doctrine is flying around. And he gets, basically ends up visiting that multiple times while it's sitting in the vicinity of it first. Second, he's so big and so flexible that uh, <clears throat> it gets tangled up with the thing and it even increases its resonance time. So we figured out that it had more to do with resonance time than anything else. Uh, and the way w we actually tested that one was to say, I'm going to ignore this one here. Well, okay, this, this just shows you that we have uh, like at, at twice the concentration of one of these, the other is there, uh, it binds five times as much, even though. <clears throat> Uh, the, the ratio of concentrations is only 2 to 1 on the scaffold, and it can be as much as 5 to 1, or in some cases 25 to 1 when it's 5 to 1 in the solution. So these big ones really like to, be, to uh, bind a whole lot more. What we did then was take it and say, well, what if we, what, maybe it's a mass thing. Maybe it's how, how fast they're diffusing. So the, fast, the slower ones are the ones that, that um, <clears throat> are going to bind more. So we took and, and, and just gave three, the, the middle size shape, the three different masses, and ran that. And we find out it has no effect at all. They bind exactly the same, regardless of the mass. But if we gave the three different um, the shapes and, and the, this geometrical oddity here the same masses, we see then we get the behavior. So it clearly has to do with the geometrical shape of these things. And this was something we wanted to pass on then to the experimentalists who were trying to design cellulosomes and they're going to want to populate them in a certain way. So we, what our interest then in was, if you throw, what concentrations do you have to throw in there to get the ratios you want on your, on your cellulosome? All right, so I think I'm going to stop there, uh, except, OK, this is the last thing, just to show that we did, in fact, measure what, what the residence times were in the vicinity of the, uh, of the, the cellulosome. And clearly, they, the, the, that big one always showed a longer residence time giving it more time to, to find its spot on the cellulosome than the others. OK, so we'll, we'll leave off with that. And uh, I don't have to go through all the thanks here, except I'd like to thank you guys for staying and listening, even though I went on for a long time.
Uh, there, no, we, we don't favor one over the other. There, it's, and in fact, they're not, in a sense, they're not true hydrogen bonds, except that they're, they're purely electrostatically generated. We, um, we don't call them a hydrogen bond unless they have the right distance and angle, but, but they interact, the way they, the way they interact is purely as, as a positive charge and a negative charge, and those charges don't change. We don't have a, any way of, of doing that in this particular force field of, of being able to have any kind of um, polarization. So they're all treated exactly the same. All atoms have their, a particular charge, and those charges don't change, and they're, and they're just, they don't depend on where they are in the crystal. They just only depend on what the atom type is. Right. Right. We actually do see that, but it's something that happens dynamically and naturally without us enforcing it or making it happen. It happens just because of the number of hydrogen bonds that are there tend to pull it together more. So it's nothing that we do. It, it happens by the, the very simple physics that we're applying to it. And we'd really like to start applying, again, not, not ones where we tell the, tell the crystal how to behave, but we put into the physics what, what ought to, uh, by, by some sort of polarization or even, even treating part of it as a sort of a quantum region where we allow it to just do exactly what it wants to do uh, electronically. So no, we don't, we don't favor one way over the other. We don't do anything to say, you're, you're a surface hydrogen bond and you're an interior hydrogen bond. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, you, you go ahead and pick. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you didn't give him the quarter, so. I don't know what that perspective is. I'm not saying it isn't a valid one, I, but I, I don't know. I don't distinguish perspective. Um, in terms of making them more efficient, we're at the point where we, we can suggest uh, mutations that we think will affect certain parts of the process. Mm -hmm. Now, we can't predict how it will affect the entire process, so we may break it by doing that. But we can suggest mutations inside the tunnel and say with the expulsion of the product that could maybe expelling the product quicker, making it easier for it to leave and less likely to bind back will help to make this thing faster. Um, we're also looking at, at the cellulose itself now we know something about which chains are the easier ones to remove. Looking at different morphologies, we've also looked at, actually done the same experiments on cellulose 2 and cellulose 3 and found out that in fact those are easier to peel out of the surface than cellulose 1 in, in our simple force field model here. So, um, so that's another attack we're looking at. It's not, it's not necessarily just the enzyme that you need to look at. You, you could make that faster, but why not look at, at both, and why not then tune them both to match whatever is the, the best in both worlds? I don't know if that answers your question specifically, but, but that is where we're going is to, is to suggest mutations and, and to look at, at sometimes looking at enzymes that we know are faster and see what about this one makes it faster than this one, and then applying it, the, you know, the, whatever yeah. we see as being the difference. Right now, yeah, so we are going to play that a little bit empirically because it's a tricky business. We think that the hydrogen bonding, even though it slows down, you know, it, it kind of keeps the thing from moving. We think it's probably pretty important because it also keeps it from pulling out of the tunnel and going back into the crystal. So we're pretty sure they have to be there. But the way to really find out, I think, at this point, because this, the problem is so complex, is to, is to pick out which ones those are and suggest that to experimentalists and see what effect it has. And I realize that that's, that's, that's a little bit empirical and not, maybe not, I don't know if that's an engineering perspective or not, but that is, okay. We see, um, one thing we do see is, is on the CBM1, 
that's on the CBH1, there's an internal tyrosine that we do see flip out onto the surface. However, a slight tweak of the force field, and it doesn't do that. So we don't know which one is right. And we've got, we've got the experimentalists looking at that by, we said, how about mutating this tyrosine into a phenylalanine and see whether it affects the binding there, because then that'll tell us whether, which, you know, should we be seeing this thing come out or shouldn't we? Um, in terms of unraveling, we've seen it unravel a bit when we turn it upside down on the surface, sort of this, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's some residues on the top of the CBM, well, what's considered the top of the CBM, that, that look like they could bind also. In fact, John Brady has done then some simulations of, of just glucose with CBMs and dissolved glucose and sees the glucose binding on the top as well as on the bottom. So when we turn it upside down, we do see it sort of fall apart onto the surface there. But we don't know what to make of it yet. Um, That's, I don't know. The one thing we found is that, this, that um, when we mutate to stronger binding uh, on the surface, it doesn't necessarily stop it from moving. Um, the, yeah, it, it, that's what we've seen. But, but, but we haven't gone that far with it, so I, I can't answer that definitively. You, you, you might be right. I don't know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But we've got to got to you know, learn how to do it right before we start um, pushing into the other proteins. But that's what we're staged to do now. Oh, okay. Uh, and so? One enzyme yeah. Uh, into the surface. One would expect the coverages to be much higher. You understand what I mean? Five of them close together. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, except I think that our problem does not, the, the problem we're looking at which is what we think is coming, say, from corn stover or from, from wood. The microfibrils, I think, are, are too small for them to be anything more than one lined up in front or behind each other. I don't think they can get next to each other. I don't think we have any cellulose that we expect to be in biomass that actually does have large surfaces that would allow more than one or two to be there because... That would mean to double the concentration. You shouldn't get any higher um, I don't think that's true because what you would have is it, you still can bind them behind each other, although it'll be on the next chain down. You know, as this one eats the top layer, the next one will be on the one below it. And the more you put on there, you would expect, you know, more on there. So I... More than one chain in the real world. That, that's right, yeah. So, but, I, but, there, but if you look at the size of what we consider to be a microfiber, in fact, they're, they're fairly well measured to be between three and five nanometers. That's the size of the enzyme. It's about that size also. So there really isn't room for more than one of them on, on one of the surface of one of these microfibrils. Okay. And the sensitivity to, to what? To our force field parameters or to what? The amount of movement you saw or twisting, was there any dependence on how long the chain Oh, how long the chain is? No, because of, this is a computational limitation. That would be a great thing to, to run. We're very interested in it. But until we can get the, the, um, the uh, implicit solvent reliable, we have to put water around it. And when you get to these long chains and putting water around it, we can't simulate for long enough to... To, to get an answer that would be meaningful. So we have not addressed that, although we'd really like to. And, and the other thing is, um, so you're doing, it looks like molecular dynamics on quite a few chains to the active crash and over a relatively short time scale. That's right. And I'm just wondering, the, if you think you're really sampling what might be the event that is not yet. Right, not yet, but see, we're not doing it. In, we're not really interested in doing this on the time scale of the enzyme. We're interested in getting sampling by by putting it in each place and sampling it while it's there, so that we get we basically get um, we we can fill out that part of the ensemble without having to wait for it to happen by running forever. So we, we're refining this that that simulation. In fact, what you saw there of it moving, though that was actually not. We didn't actually move it through. 
No, we weren't pulling it at all, is what I'm saying. There were springs there pulling it into place, but it was purely a minimization. It was an optimization pro problem. So it was the optimal energy uh, set of points to have, to have one point at one end and one point at the other end and, and have uh, like 40 copies in the middle. All of them sort of sprung together. What's the lowest energy that you could have with, with all of them in that place? It didn't have anything to do with dynamics or time at all. And, but, but what we will do is once we've got a decent pathway, we'll start sampling that by, by keeping it in each one of these configurations and not waiting for it to go, because that would, you're right, it would take, we, we would never get it, you know, we, we, we really wouldn't be able to do it because that's on the seconds time scale. We, can't even, we can barely do microseconds right now. So there are other ways of getting the, those, uh, that, that kind of sampling without waiting for that time to happen. If, it were, if we were just trying to do that, you'd be absolutely right. We, you know, the, the answers would be nearly meaningless because of how fast we were doing it. Okay. Thank you.